Hello, my name is David Delgado, and in this lesson, I'm going to introduce the concept of two-dimensional arrays using C++. Before we dive into the concept of two-dimensional arrays, I want to briefly review the concept of one-dimensional arrays. So an array is basically a special variable that could store multiple values of the same data type. So even though um, an array could store multiple values, all these values must have the same data type. The values of an array are stored in adjacent memory locations. Now, why is this important? This is important because it's going to enable programs to quickly and efficiently process all the values in the array since they're stored in consecutive memory locations. Also, a key feature of an array is that each value, also known as, as an element, is given a unique number known as an index or subscript. So this, this index or subscript identifies the location of an item in the array. So if we look at the example here on the right, we have um, an array of integers called my items. This array has seven elements. Notice that the first element, the index of the first element is zero, and the index of the last element is six, even though this array has seven elements. So it turns out that the, the index of the first element of an array is always going to be zero. The index of the last element of an array is always going to be one less than the size of the array or number of elements. Since this array has seven elements, then seven minus one is six. Also, um, it's important to point out that this array is a one dimensional array. A one dimensional array could be visualized as a one column table with multiple rows. Okay, so let's talk now about the code that was used to create this array. So when you're going to define an array, you want to begin by specifying the data type of the elements of the array. So in this case, we're using int for integer. So all the um, elements in this array will be integers. Then we provide the name of the array, in this case, my items. And it suggested that we make the name plural for clarity since an array actually holds more than one value. It's, it holds a group of values. And then to it, we indicate the size of that array by placing the number of elements within brackets after the name of the array. With regards to initializing the value or values of one array, we could either do it after the array is declared, or like we're doing in this example, we could initialize the values of the array in the same statement as it's being declared. So notice that the values that we're using to initialize this array are placed within braces, and then each value or, el each value or element is separated with a comma. The order in which we specify these values is important. So 92, the first value, is used to initialize the first element in the array, and the 68, which is the last value in this list, is used to initialize the last element of the array. Let's look at the Cout statement. This Cout statement demonstrates how the elements in an array are accessed. So to access the element of an array, you have to provide, provide the name of the array, in this case is my items, and then within the brackets, you're going to specify the index of that item. So in this case, the index uses six so that's why this Cout statement is outputting 68, which happens to be the element, the element at, pos at position six in the array. Okay, so now let's talk about two-dimensional arrays. So conceptually, a two-dimensional array is simply a table with rows and columns, as we could see in the example at the bottom of the slide. So this two-dimensional array has four rows, one, two, three, four, and three columns, one, two, and three. Just like with regular one-dimensional arrays, 
all the values or items of a two-dimensional array must have the same data type. When creating a two-dimensional array, you need to specify both dimensions. You need to specify the number of rows and the number of columns, and it must be done in a specific order. You always have to specify the number of rows first and the number of columns second. Let's look at the code that creates this two-dimensional array or table. So notice that we're using two constants for the rows and the columns. This is actually a good practice to use constants to um, indicate the different dimensions of the array. And just like before, you have to begin with the data type. In this case, we're creating a two-dimensional array of integers. We provide the name of the array, and then we specify the number of the rows and the number of the columns. So again, you must specify the rows first, the columns second. Now, how do we access a specific element in this 2D uh, in a two-dimensional array? Well, since there are two dimensions, you have to use two indices. You have to use the index of the row and then the index of the column. And it has to be done in this order. This is important. So we always specify the index of the row and then the index of the column. So it turns out that the row and column indices of a two-dimensional array start at zero. So the first row of this table has an index of zero, then the next one has an index of one, then index of two, and the last row has an index of three. So notice that the index of the last row is one less than the number of rows. So since we have four rows, 4 minus 1 is 3. For columns, the index of the first one is 0. Then the index of the second column will be 1. And the index of the last column is 2. And again, for, for the index of the last column, it's going to be 1 less than the number of columns. We have 3 columns, so 3 minus 1 is 2. If we want to access the first element in this table, then we need to provide zero for the row index. Remember that the row, the row index goes first, the column index goes second. So zero for the row index, zero for the column index. If we wanted to access the last element in this table, then we would use three for the row index and two for the column index. If we wanted to access the element in the third row of this table and the second column, we would have to use two for the row index and then one for the column index since the indices of rows and columns start at zero. So similar to one dimensional arrays, two dimensional arrays can be initialized after they have been declared or in the same statement in which they're declared, like it's done in this example. Two dimensional arrays are initialized row by row. So in this example, we notice that the row values have been enclosed within braces and the different rows have been separated with a comma. We see that the first row was initialized with the values 84, 88, and 82, and so on. We also see that the values of each row were placed in different lines, in separate lines. This is done for clarity. However, it's not a requirement. If we want to, we could also initialize all the rows of the array in the same line. Okay, so next, we're going to see how to sum the rows of a two-dimensional array. However, before we do so, I want to point out the importance of understanding what each dimension in a two-dimensional array represents. In this example, we have a two-dimensional array of integers called scores, and it stores the uh, grades for three exams, three exams for four students. So in this two-dimensional array, we clearly see that the rows represent the students and the columns represent the different exams that have been given. The values in row zero are the scores that student one obtained. The values in row one 
correspond to the scores for student two. Also, um, the values in a particular column, such as the values in column one, represent all the scores for that particular exam. So the values in column one correspond to the exam two scores obtained by the four students. So um, the code that we have here on the left is going to compute the average score for each student. And it's going to do so by adding all the rows and dividing by three. This is going to be done row by row. So to find the average of the first student, we're going to add 84, 88, and 82, and then we're going to divide by three. Since this is a two-dimensional array, we need to use two loops in order to process the array. We need one loop for each dimension. In a one-dimensional array, since it has a single dimension, a single loop is required. But for two dimensions, we need two loops. That's why you see nested loops in this example. The, the outer loop is going to iterate once per row or per student. So our outer loop is going to iterate four times. The inner loop is going to iterate three times, once for each column for a specific row. So for example, when the outer loop is processing the, when it's processing row zero, the inner loop is going to iterate once for each column in this row. The, um, the objective of the inner loop is to obtain the total points in a given row so that we could divide by three and then obtain the average. Let's go ahead and step through the code to understand how these averages are being obtained. So we see that the counter for the outer loop is called row. It's initialized to zero. And the outer loop is going to execute as long as row is less than four. So therefore, the outer loop is going to iterate once for row zero, once for row one, once for row two, and then once for row three. The first task that we're going to perform in the outer loop is setting total equal to zero. And this is important because we want to go ahead and make sure that we reset the previous total, the total from the previous row with different student to zero before we start adding up the scores of the next student. So this is very important. Once we set the total equal to zero, the inner loop is going to add up the values in that specific row in order to find the total number of points. Notice that the counter of the inner loop is called call for column. It's being initialized to zero and the inner loop is going to execute as long as the column counter is less than three. So therefore it's going to execute once for column zero, once for column one, and then once for column two. In the first iteration of the outer loop, I'm trying to get my pen to work. If you could just bear with me, here we go. Okay, so in the first iteration of the outer loop, the row counter is going to be zero since this is the first iteration of the outer loop. And it's important to notice that for all the iterations of the inner loop, the row counter is going to remain at zero. What's going to change is the value of the column counter. Now, in the first iteration of the inner loop, the column counter is going to be one. So in the first iteration of the inner loop, we're going to be adding 84 to our total. Then the column counter is going to be incremented. So it's going to be set to two, sorry, to one in the next iteration. So in the next iteration, the second iteration, the column counter is going to be one. So in this iteration, we're going to be adding the 88 in row zero to our total. Then finally, in the last iteration of our inner loop, the column counter is going to be set to, to two. So therefore, we're going to be adding the 82, the exam three score to the total. And this is going to give us 
a total of 254 points for the first student. So once, once all the values in that row have been added up, the, the inner loop is going to exit. And then in the next statement, we're going to compute the average by dividing the total in that row by the number of scores, which is three. 254 divided by three is about 84.6. So the average of the first student is going to be 84.6. That once we compute the average, the last statement is actually going to output that average. But notice, notice that we're using the row counter to identify the student. Also notice that we're adding one to the row counter. Why? In order to make the output more user friendly. So instead of outputting student zero for the average of our first student, by adding one to the row counter, zero plus one, it'll display student one, making the output more user friendly. So once we um, finish one whole iteration of the other loop and we obtain the average of one student, we're going to go to the beginning of the, um, the outer loop and we're going to increment our row counter in order to get ready to move on to the next row and that we're going to perform the same process in order to find the average for that row. So this outer loop in this example is going to execute four times, once per row in order to find the averages of the four students. In our last example, we're going to see how to sum the columns in a two-dimensional array. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to use the array from the previous example. In this example, we're going to be obtaining the class average for each exam. We're going to do so by processing this uh, table column by column. So we're going to be adding up the values of each column and then we're going to divide by four which is the number of students in order to obtain the averages the um the outer loop this time is going to be iterating on the number of columns and the inner loop is going to be iterating on the number of rows so the rows of the nested loops has been reversed let's go ahead and step through the code to understand how these averages, how these class averages are going to be obtained. So notice that um, we have changed the name of the outer loop counter to call for column since now the outer loop is going to be iterating on the number of columns. And it's going to iterate once for column zero, once for column one, and once for column two. So once for each exam. The first task, like before, is going to be is going to be to reset the total equal to zero. Once we set the total equal to zero, our inner loop is going to iterate once per row for that particular column in order to find the total number of points of all the students for that exam so that we could divide by four and get the average. So in the first iteration of our, of our outer loop, the column counter is going to be zero. And for all the iterations of the, iter of the inner loop is going to remain constant, so it's gonna be zero. What's gonna be changing in each iteration of the inner loop is gonna be the row counter. For the first iteration of our inner loop, the row counter is gonna be zero. So that means that in first iteration, it's going to add 84 to the total. Then the row counter is going to be incremented. So therefore, it's going to be set to, to one. So in our second iteration, we're going to be accessing the value in row one and column zero, which happens to be the exam one score of the second student. So we're gonna add that to the total. In our next iteration, the row counter is going to be set to two. It's going to be set to two. So we're going to be adding the exam one score of the third student to the total. 
And then finally, in the last iteration of our inner loop, the row counter is going to be set to three. So in this last iteration, we're going to be adding 100, the exam one score of the last student, to our total. So if we add up all these values, the total is going to be 371. So once we have obtained the total number of points for that particular exam, the inner loop is going to exit. And then our next statement is going to compute the class average by dividing the total number of points by the number of students. So 371 divided by four comes out to approximately 92.75. So the average, the class average for the first exam is going to be about 92.75, which means that the class did an outstanding job in this first exam. Then finally, we're going to go ahead and display the average that's done in the CL statement. And then once again, notice that we're adding one to the column counter in order to make the output more user friendly. So instead of displaying, instead of outputting the class average for test zero, our output is going to say class average for test one, since we're adding one to the column counter. Once we finish one iteration of the other loop, we're going to go to the beginning of the other loop and we're going to increment the column counter. The column counter was previously zero. Now it's going to be set to one. That means that in our next iteration of the other loop, we're going to be processing the average for the second exam. Um, in our next lesson, we're going to see how to work with arrays having more than two dimensions. So there's actually no limit on the number of dimensions that an array could have. Thank you for watching.